today I am want to talk about a somewhat newer line of research that we've been engaged in, although it's related to our long-standing interest in schizophrenia, but really starting to look at um, can we identify child slash adolescent indicators of risk for psychosis. Um, and before going too far, I really want to highlight uh, my postdoc, Nicole Karcher, who has really taken a lead on a lot of this work, so I want to give credit where credit's due. And also to highlight all the people who helped with the initial development of the measure uh, that I'm going to talk a bit about, um, uh, some of whom are here, um, and colleagues across the country, because this is a very large project. It's definitely a team effort, so I want to start there. Let me talk about what psychosis is. Um, many people in this room know, you know as much, if not more, than I do about this. But since I was told that we might have a very broad audience of individuals here today, I would, thought I would start by sort of orienting us to what we mean by psychosis. Um, this is a very debilitating illness. Um, it affects about 1% of the population in terms of sort of full clinical diagnoses of schizophrenia, although it's a, a larger percentage if you look at the kind of broader spectrum of disorders that involve psychosis. Um, it often strikes just as young people are emerging into adulthood, so late adolescence, early adulthood, you know, as people are graduating from high school, going into college, moving away from home. Um, it is often, though not always, chronic and debilitating. Um, and I think the thing that is often unappreciated is that it is one of the 10 leading causes of disability in the US and really across the world um, in terms of things like a loss of productivity, challenges in people's ability to work, the demands on health care and public support systems. And if we're really going to be sort of very specific and financial about it, um, you know, different years estimate different dollars, but in, I think this number is from 2013, the direct and indirect costs of schizophrenia to U.S. society has been estimated as much as $155 billion, right? That's $44,000 per individual with the disease, and that's probably an underestimate of the lifetime costs. And just to put that in context, if you look at depression, which affects six times as many people, the cost is $210 billion. So only 35% more, even though it's six times as many people, right? So disorders like schizophrenia and others as well really place a huge demand on our public health system. And you know, hopefully we're interested in being able to detect, prevent, cure, just because we care that these individuals suffer. But, but even just from a purely financial perspective, right? We would be far better off in terms of our economy by preventing and you know, intervening early so people don't have to go on to a lifetime of need for care and loss of productivity. Um, so how do we tell if someone has psychosis? It's not always easy. Um, there are some signs and symptoms that are more strongly linked to having psychosis. So things like seeing and hearing voices that aren't real. We sometimes refer to that as hallucinations. Um, uh, unusual or bizarre thoughts or ideas, confusing things like television and dreams with reality, confused thinking, people th thinking people are out to get them or hurt them or harm them. Um, there are other things that can be associated with developing psychosis but are not necessarily an indication. So odd or eccentric behavior, difficulty relating to peers, withdrawing, being isolated, a decline in personal hygiene, those things are usually more strongly associated with psychosis if they are a change from previous function as opposed to something that the individual has been experiencing their entire lifetime, right? Um, so these are the things that we're usually looking for in people that we are going to give sort of a full-blown blown clinical diagnosis to, but we'll talk a little bit more about perhaps the more subtle signs and symptoms that we might see earlier in a person's life or earlier in the course of illness that might be associated with risk for developing um, a, a more severe disorder later in life. So this is not a place really where I even need to put this slide up, but I think there is a growing recogni recognition that early identification is key. Um, and I think part of the reason we need to argue for this is that if you wait until someone really has sort of a full-blown clinical disorder, it often means that they have spent many years of their life 
with symptoms or developing symptoms. And often for people who have more neurodevelopmental disorders, it means that much of their development has been spent having atypical developmental experiences. And if you don't identify that individual until they are, say, a late adolescent or an adult, it is going to be very challenging to go back and sort of rewire those experiences, right? Whereas if you can identify people earlier in the course before they've had this sort of negative developmental trajectory, you might have more success in sort of shifting them back onto a healthy or a typical developmental trajectory. Um, and so that's, I think, been one of the reasons why early identification is considered to be so important. Um, there's certainly a literature about risk for psychosis that would support the idea that we could try to identify and intervene earlier. So if you look at people who are at genetic risk for schizophrenia because they might have a relative with schizophrenia, we do see that they have some, uh, maybe mild's not the word, but a sort of um, less clinically diagnosable form of some of the same signs and symptoms that we see in people with diagnosed schizophrenia. Um, there's also some suggestion that the duration of time that people spend with untreated psychosis may be, in some sense, toxic and more associated with poor outcome. Um, so this idea that the experience, repetitive experience of having psychosis may be problematic in and of itself. So again, the earlier you can intervene or even prevent you know, more severe psychosis, the better that might be for brain development, behavioral development, a range of things. I like to think about schizophrenia, I don't like to think about it this way, but I think there is some evidence that schizophrenia is in some ways a progressive disorder. So this is a chart of time to diagnosis. So think of here as when the individual ends up getting a clinical diagnosis of a psychotic disorder like schizophrenia. And we'll say symptom severity higher up here is more severe. And what I have plotted here is sort of what mood disorder often looks like, which is for many people, a more sort of cyclical thing where they will have episodes of depression that might remit. Um, I understand that it can be more complex than that, but often remitting and so on. Whereas if you look for psychosis, the cognitive deficits associated with psychosis um, often are present even prior to the onset of, of diagnosis, but in some studies at least get worse over time. Um, if you look at psychosis, right, it may be peaking about the time that they're diagnosing, but then you may have repeated episodes potentially with increasing severity, though not always. And if you look at something that's referred to as negative symptoms, so these would be things like difficulties with motivation, problems with experiencing pleasure, not sort of a lot of uh, motor activation. Those, again, may be present prior to the on onset of diagnosis, but in some cases may get more severe, right? So often we're identifying people here and treating somewhere here, but treatment doesn't always work so well. It, it's not to say that I'm not at all wanting to present a hopeless situation. There are some things that can be quite helpful, but for many people, right, they've often already spent years of being actively psychotic or having this illness, and interventions here, at least for you know, some aspects of the illness, don't always work very well, right? So for example, you know, you might be able to do you know, a reasonable job of reducing psychotic symptoms like hallucinations and delusions, but we have basically had very little effectiveness in treating negative symptoms or cognitive deficits once the person is diagnosed with the illness. Um, so many people have started to look at moving treatment earlier, and, and uh, here is really one of the places that has been at the forefront of this kind of work looking to try to identify people more in what we might refer to as the prodrome of the illness. So before they really have symptom profiles that would indicate a kind of a full diagnosis, but they're starting to have some difficulties that indicate they might be on that pathway. Um, so many people refer to this as the clinical high risk approach. Um, and this is the idea that you can identify these early indicators or predictors of who may be on the course to develop psychosis. And ideally, right, the idea is that you'd be then able to explore avenues of early intervention or prevention of more serious illness development. And there's a couple ways people have done that. So what's referred to as at-risk mental states. So looking for things like an onset or a worsening in the past 12 months of unusual thought content, suspicion, some perceptual, perceptual abnormalities, maybe not really fully hearing voices or seeing things.
some grandiosity, some disorganized communication, but not to the level of severity that would warrant a clinical diagnosis of schizophrenia or something in that spectrum. There's also what people have referred to as blips or brief limited intermittent psychotic symptoms. Um, so onset in the past three months, kind of similar to an acute episode of psychosis, but they resolve. And then also some people have looked at genetic risk and functional deterioration. So people who have a first degree relative with schizophrenia and start to experience some decline in function even if they don't have overt psychotic symptoms. Um, and so uh, various groups have taken different approaches to identifying these individuals. Um, I think here at UC Davis, you guys focus more on the sort of at-risk mental states and blips, but um, you know, this, this has been a very interesting and fruitful approach for many people. Um, so if you look at rates of conversion to psychosis, um, it looks like from meta-analysis about 26% of those individuals have what would be considered a full-blown psychotic episode within about two and a half years, right? So, and the question is what type of psychosis they develop. So um, there are a number of different forms of mental illness that involve psychosis. When you look at some of these studies, it suggests that the vast majority are developing, when they do convert, they are developing something that we would consider a schizophrenia spectrum disorder, schizophrenia. Um, but they can also develop mood disorders with psychosis, like bipolar disorder or depression or other psychoses. Um, and there are some promising interventions, for example, psychotherapeutic approaches that can be helpful to these individuals. I will argue, though, that these adolescents, and they're often adolescents, are still quite ill, right? This, while not something that we can yet diagnose with sort of DSM, diagnoses, they are experiencing symptoms often that can be quite distressing, can be quite impairing to their function. Um, and from that perspective of wanting to intervene early to sort of push the ball back on a healthier trajectory, ideally, if we could, we'd push the arrow even earlier to identify kids um, who we think are on this trajectory, but before at an even kind of milder symptom profile before they've had as much distress or negative experience. Um, and that's what I'm going to focus on today is our efforts to try to identify some methods for doing that. So like I said here, ideally we get to it even in this more pre-morbid state, even earlier from the time to diagnosis so that we have more time to try to do some sort of prevention or very, very early intervention, again, that would tip people hopefully onto a healthier trajectory. And particularly if we're talking about this younger in adolescence or even childhood, so that they can have more of a typical developmental experience that hopefully would put them in a better place later in life, even if they ended up you know, having greater symptom severity later on. All right, so how do we do that? This has really been a holy grail of psychopathology research, and it's very challenging to do with disorders that are what we would call low base rate, meaning, um, if we had something that occurred in, say, 30% of the population, it wouldn't be so challenging to go out and get an epidemiological study, um, follow kids for 5, 10 years, and you'd, you'd be able to identify, ideally, predictors of those outcomes because they're happening in like 30% of the kids, right? But that's actually very challenging to do when you have something that might only be occurring in its full-blown form in maybe 1% of the population, and even in the kind of spectrum, maybe only in 10% of the population. So it has been very difficult to do more sort of general population studies. And much of the research has focused on high-risk paradigms, like looking at children who had a parent with schizophrenia or children who had a sibling with schizophrenia. Those can be very useful, and they have been very useful, but they're often small ends, and they come with some complications. Um, we kind of backed into a unique data set or study in order to try to look at this as part of something called the Adolescent Brain and Cognitive Development Study. Um, and this study provides very unique data because it is very large for a study of this design. I'll tell you more about it. Um, and has allowed us to collect data from a pretty wide swath of kids that, in a way that is meant to be pretty representative of the US population, 
um, and to start to follow them longitudinally, really kind of population neuroscience in a way that we have not been able to do before. Although, truth in advertising, the UK has beat us to the punch, and they have an aging population that's 500,000 people. When I talk about my 11,872 kids, that makes me feel small. But in terms of adolescent development, this is the, the biggest sort of population neuroscience one. Um, and one of the reasons that the National Institute of Mental Health invested in this study was specifically to try to look at identifying early risk predictors of psychosis and looking at how it interacted with other experiences that kids might have, like substance use, cannabis use, stress, other sorts of things. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the ABCD study. Um, for all of the scientists in the room, I should point out that this is going to be all public release data, and it is available to anybody to use. Um, the first half of the baseline sample was released last January. We call that ABCD 1.0, and we are about to release the entire baseline sample of data plus the first um, half of the first wave follow-up. Um, so if anybody wants to know about how to get access to that data or to find out more about what's contained in the data set, because it has much more that I'm going to tell you about today, I'm happy to talk to you about it. And we have a whole series in developmental cognitive neuroscience of papers that describe different components, like the logic of the study, the design, the sampling strategy. Uh, we have papers from each of the work groups about the different kinds of measures. We have papers about the imaging acquisition. So we tried to put a lot out there to make it accessible to people. All right, so the ABCD, um, the uh, original goal was 11,000 kids, and we hit 11,874. Um, we have completed baseline enrollment. These are all 9 and 10-year-old children sampled from, I'll show you, 21 sites across the country. And the goal is for us to follow them for at least 10 years. Um, the original goal was to identify developmental trajectories of brain, cognition, emotion, academic development, and look at factors that can impact those. Um, ideally, to develop some national standards of normative brain development. Um, look at genetic versus environmental factors. So we have embedded a twin design in the study. Um, so we can look at that as well as molecular genetics. Um, and in particular, to look at the onset and progression of mental disorders, the things that influence them, the things that uh, relate them to substance use as well. Um, and in particular, looking at how exposure to substances might modify risk factors for various forms of mental illness. Um, we are uh, diverse across the country. Um, you'll notice over here, it's not you guys, it's SRI. <laughs> um, we have, you know, Oregon. We have several sites in the sort of Southern California, Florida. Um, you'll notice we are kind of have a gap in rural parts of the world. Uh, not, well, the world, but the US um, and Texas. Um, you know, we recognize that that's a gap. It partly reflects, not Texas, but other parts reflects needing to be close to an academic center that has a research grade scanner. Um, and the individual sites were tasked with outreach to try to get rural communities around them. But I always kind of advertise to everybody that I, 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 we realize that we have not done as good a job as we could have in covering rural communities and maybe risk factors that might be particularly relevant to rural communities. Um, but this is the distribution, and these are the sites that will continue to follow people over time. The way ABCD works is kids came in for this baseline when they were 9 and 10. Um, kids do a lot of stuff. Six to seven hours is a conservative estimate of how long it actually took kids. Um, they did a pretty extensive neuroimaging battery, cognitive tests, interviews. Um, and because they were 9 and 10, there was a lot of playing, too, and earning prizes and so on. Uh, parents also did a bunch. Um, we also got saliva and blood for DNA and, you know, kind of early indicators of substance use. We're collecting hair for a variety of analyses, too. We call kids and their families every six months on the phone to do a check-in, and we get very brief measures of mental health and exposure to substances. And then they come back in again. A year later, for another in-person session, they do not get MRI here, but then they come back again here and they get MRI again. So over 10 years, we hope to do 10 in-person visits, five of which include the full MRI battery and five of which don't. Um, 
We, of course, will hope that we get to do more than 10 years because all the interesting outcomes won't be done by 19 or 20, but this is sort of the starting goal, um, given that we know adolescence brackets a period of really high risk for a lot of things. Um, I should point out that we're trying to roll out more things as we go along. So uh, year two, we started having every kid wear fits, Fitbits for three weeks to look at physical activity and sleep. Um, we're also working on a better assessment of mobile technology because everybody asks us about use of, of electronic media and all sorts of things. Um, so, and we're, we get also get teacher reports on every kid every year, so a pretty wide database. If you have ideas for things we really should be measuring that we aren't, we're always open to hear about it. Can't guarantee we can do it, but we're always open to hear about it. All right. So how do we assess risk in children? Um, one of the challenges of this study was that it got funded and we had to get in the field very quickly. So we did not have time at all to like create new measures, measures from scratch and to validate them. Super fortunate, called Rachel Lowy, said, has anybody done anything with the PQB and younger people? And she said, oh, by the way, I've been working with my colleagues at the mine to modify this measure to be appropriate for use in younger children through some of their work in 22Q deletion syndrome. Um, so we piggybacked on that because there really was no other measure that had been validated for a young population. And so they had taken the original psychotic questionnaire, psychosis questionnaire brief and modified it to be appropriate with younger kids. Um, and I'll just give you a sample of some of the questions that the kids get asked to kind of give you a sense because people always want to know what does this look like. So um, they took the questions for adults and tried to make them more user friendly for kids. So kids get asked, do you feel like you had special or unusual powers? Like you could make things happen by magic. You could magically know what was inside another person's mind or magically know what was going to happen in the future when other people could not. Or did you feel confused because something you experienced didn't seem real or seemed imaginary to you? Did you other, feel that other people might want something bad to happen to you or that you could not trust other people? Did you suddenly start to be able to see things that other people could not see or they did not seem to see? And for a number of these questions, we recognize that there might be some um, age-typical experiences that could be driving that response or, for example, other people might want something bad to happen to you. That actually could be happening. So a number of them had follow-up open response options so that we could find out what was driving it. And I can tell you that I've read through all of those. And in some cases, what kids were responding to, I would not necessarily call a psychotic-like experience. Um, the anecdote I always tell, when we first rolled this out, and I said this at lunch, so I'm repeating myself. Um, when we first rolled this out and we're asking kids this, it was right about the time the movie It came out, which is, I don't know, so apparently some people let their nine and 10 year old kids watch it, and I read a lot about scary clowns hiding outside my window. So in that case, you know, I would not necessarily, so I wouldn't call that a psychotic-like experience because it's pretty age-typical for a kid to watch a scary movie. Or a kid might say, yeah, you know, there were gunshots in my neighborhood and I was worried that someone was trying to harm me. And I wouldn't call those psychotic-like experiences. But in many cases, when a kid endorsed yes, what they reported is something that I would consider to be in the vein of a psychotic-like experience, things that were not age-typical, not normative. Um, those open-ended responses are available. Um, truth in advertising, everything, we, we ended up feeling like those were low frequency enough that we, we just took the endorsements and didn't go back and recode all 11,872 responses for 21 questions um, as to whether they were psychotic or not. Um, but that is available if someone should feel like they really want to go back and do that. But I, I can, having looked through a lot of them, the vast majority of them are things I would call psychotic-like experiences. We also have all the individual items available. So if you felt like you really wanted to focus on certain items and not others, one could do that as well. And it, I'm not going to show you this data here, but it shows a lot of very good psychometric characteristics. It's a single factor at this age. It shows what we would call measurement invariance across gender and race, meaning that it seems to be measuring the same thing in boys and girls and measuring the same sort of psychosis fact, psychotic-like, I don't want to call it psychosis, factor in across different races and ethnicities. Um, but I, if, I'm happy to point you to the paper if people are interested in that.
After they endorse whether or not they've had that experience, we then ask them, does it bother you? Because there's evidence that the distress associated with that experience may be important in discriminating kids who are having something that we really would consider sort of a risk factor for later development versus not. If they say it distressed them, then they, they choose how much it distressed them. Um, and this was, uh, this was not our scale. This was the scale developed by the, um, the people who developed this measure. Um, so they could say it you know, didn't distress them much up to it was very distressing. Um, and so we've looked both at total scores and distress scores. Um, when there's a difference, it tends to be in the direction of the, the distress score being more associated with things, but, but they generally show a similar effect. All right. So what do we see in terms of um, things that we know about being true in adults with psychosis? So one of the things that we looked at was um, overall mean scores um, as a function of race and ethnicity, because there is evidence in the adult literature that unfortunately individuals in more minority populations will tend to report higher levels of psychosis. Theories about whether that's related to you know, discrimination or st increased stress associated with you know, living in a minority population in a majority society. Um, unfortunately, consistent with that, we do see that um, uh, the children of African American heritage report higher psychotic-like experiences, as do children who report being Hispanic. Um, this other category was a bit of a lumping together. Um, as the sample got bigger, we can split things out. but. Um, this was a combination of Asian American and other ethnicities as well. Um, so the, this is unfortunately, like I said, consistent with the adult literature, which suggests some greater experiences of psychosis in minority populations. And this was true for both the total and the distress scores, but particularly true for the distress scores. We then wanted to say, could we validate this by looking at whether it's related to things that you would predict it to be related to based on the adult schizophrenia literature? So the first thing we looked at was relationship to family history of mental illness. So we have um, the parents fill out a modified family interview that gives um, all the first degree relatives uh, history of mental illness. And so we first looked at whether the family uh, reported a, a family history of psychotic disorders. And what you can see here is that those uh, kids who had family histories of psychotic disorders showed significantly higher self-reported psychotic-like experiences, right? which is what you would predict based on the high-risk literature. Um, we have then looked at how specific is that to a family history of psychotic disorder. So we looked also at family history of depression and family history of mania. And you do not see as much evidence for it here as you do here. So at least hints at some specificity to family history of psychotic disorders. What about other mental health variables? If you talk to people, I think, who do clinical high risk work, those kids are often depressed and anxious, right? They are not just having psychotic experiences. So we looked in this sample at whether um, increase, and these are the, in case I didn't say it clearly, these are the kids reporting their own psychotic-like experiences. We also have kids reports of depression and anxiety, and we have parent estimates of depression and anxiety. And what we see is that the, the higher distress scores are associated with greater depression as reported by both child and parent. So these children are having depression as well, and greater anxiety as reported by both child and parent. And parent. I think that's not particularly surprising, given that they're reporting a lot of distress, but it is, again, consistent with the clinical high-risk literature. Um, and if you look at, we have four, well, we have a couple ways of measuring parent report. Most of the parent report stuff is really focused on sort of full-blown clinical levels of psychosis, but we do see a relationship, some relationship, it's kind of modest, between parent report of psychotic-like symptoms in the kids and the kids' own self-report of that as well. Now, what are other things that we have known from the literature to be associated with or predictive of psychosis? Um, motor abnormalities are a domain where there's some evidence. So if you look in the existing literature, we see that about 50 to 65% of individuals with clinically diagnosed schizophrenia have some sort of um, neurological soft signs and really a range of other kinds of motor impairments. If you look at the prediction literature, you see evidence that delayed motor milestones in infancy are associated with an increased risk of developing psychosis later in life. 
We also see that neurological soft signs in infancy are associated with a greater risk later on in life. We see things like unusual movements or postural abnormalities being associated with greater risk for psychosis. And also, even in middle childhood, problems with motor coordination, clumsiness, and neurological soft signs. Okay, so um, this literature has looked at you know, the specificity. There's some evidence for this being somewhat specific to the development of psychosis. So we wanted to look at whether or not um, self-reports of psychotic-like experiences were also associated with anything in this domain of function. Um, so part of the study, we asked parents to report on delays in both speech and motor milestones. And what we see is that if you look at um, speech delays being present according to parent report or absent, we see significantly higher uh, psychotic-like experience distress scores in kids whose parent report them having speech delays. And we see the same thing with motor delays. These were aggregate measures. If you look at the individual items there, um, it's clumsiness that's most strongly associated with increased psychotic-like experiences scores. Um, the speech delays, it's really more the aggregate. But in the motor, it was more about the clumsiness. The other thing we looked at was um, IQ and cognitive function. Um, so again, looking at the earlier literature, we see that a good percentage of individuals with schizophrenia, unfortunately, have IQ measures that are below average. And there's some evidence that 95% of individuals with schizophrenia have an IQ that is lower than would have been predicted by their maternal education, which is often a good predictor of the child's IQ. Um, and there's a lot of evidence that IQ in middle childhood predicts uh, risk for developing psychosis. Although I will say this is definitely nonspecific. It predicts increased risk for pretty much every form of mental illness, unfortunately. So we looked at relationship to IQ in this sample. Um, and we looked at both um, what we call fluid IQ, which is sort of more problem solving ability. And we looked at verbal IQ, which is really vocabulary. And what I have here is uh, PQB distress severity bin by absent lower levels and higher levels in the same thing here. And you can see, again, that there's a, although modest, a significant decrement in IQ, both fluid and verbal, the, with greater severity of PQB scores. These are unage corrected, so it's not that our sample is all below average. They're just not age corrected scores. Um, so again, consistent with that earlier literature. And then we also looked at cognitive function. Um, uh, so there's uh, quite a bit of evidence that people with schizophrenia have cognitive impairment. Um, and there's some really interesting evidence from our own Tara Niendam about the fact that what we call processing speed, or the speed at which people can carry out various cognitive functions, um, uh, is worse in siblings who go on to develop psychosis than their siblings who do not go on to develop psychosis. There's also evidence, again from Tara, <laughs> uh, that they also have worse working memory than their siblings. So working memory would be like, I repeat a phone number to you and I ask you to repeat it back to me, maybe repeat it back to me backwards, right? Which requires you to hold on to that information and remember it and repeat it back. Um, and there's some evidence in high risk kids, so kids who have a parent with schizophrenia, that worse working memory is associated with risk for developing psychosis. So what do we see in our sample? Um, we see, again, that higher PQB distress scores, even when you control for family history of psychosis, income to needs, age, gender, race, are associated with worse working memory, worse processing speed, worse episodic memory, so your ability to kind of remember things over time, and with worse reading scores, right? So again, consistent with that literature suggesting that risk for psychosis is associated with impairment in these cognitive functions. What about brain networks? So many people here are very interested in the biological bases of risk. Um, and there certainly is much evidence in adults with schizophrenia that they have impairments in a wide variety of neural networks. Um, much of my career and much of some of the people's career here has been focused on networks that are thought to be important for sort of higher cognitive functions or cognitive control. Um, so how do we look at brain networks? I'll unpack this a little bit for you. There's many ways. Um, we have been involved in some initiatives that looks at trying to identify parts of the brain that seem to be what we would call functionally homogeneous or functionally similar. So each of these I'll call them parcels on the brain, 
are parts of the brain that show similar patterns of functional connections to other parts of the brain. Um, by functional connections, I simply mean if I put you in a scanner and I have you lay there quietly and I measure your spontaneous brain activity, I can look at how coordinated that is across different parts of the brain. Um, this patch, all being yellow here, says all the kind of parts of the brain included in this patch at rest, so similar patterns of coordinated brain activity over time. What you can do then, though, is take all these individual patches and say, well, are there some patches that really go together? So all the patches of the same color seem to cohere together to form networks in the brain. And these networks have been given different names over time. They are identified very consistently across individuals, across groups, across scanners. They're, they're pretty consistent. And we've been particularly interested in two of them, one that's called the frontal parietal system in yellow includes the dorsal frontal parts of the brain and the dorsal parietal cortex, thought to be very important for higher cognitive function, controlling and regulating one's behavior. But we've also been very interested in another network called the cingular opercular network, and it's these purple folks here. So this part here is part of what's called the cingulate cortex, um, in particular the dorsal cingulate cortex. Um, and actually Cam turned me on to the cingulate cortex. <laughs> he was understood its importance before some of us did. Um, and also the anterior insula, which is right in here, um, also part of the thalamus, and uh, in some studies, but not all, more anterior parts of the prefrontal cortex. And this is another brain network that seems to be very important for higher order cognitive functions, seems to be important for helping to detect errors or conflict in ongoing processing and help to signal to networks like the frontal parietal network that, hey, you need to do a better job helping to support controlling one's behavior. Um, the, if you look in the literature, so purple is the big singular or purcular, um, the literature on disruptions in these brain networks in schizophrenia is a little bit mixed. Um, in our own studies, we have seen quite consistently, though, reduced connections among the brain regions that form this singular opercular network in relationship to both psychosis and to cognitive function. And we've seen it in people with schizophrenia. We've seen it in people with bipolar disorder that involves psychosis. We've seen it in schizoaffective disorder, which is people who have sort of both. And we've seen it in adults who self-report psychotic-like symptoms. Um, and a number of other people have seen this as well. Um, we sometimes see disruptions in the frontal parietal network, the connections among those brain regions, um, but it not as consistently as we see uh, changes in the single opercular network. We tend to see more disruptions in the frontal parietal network in terms of how active it is in response to demands to execute cognitive control. So we wanted to look at whether or not in these kids who report distressing psychotic-like experiences, do they also show disruptions in this network? Um, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Um, so this is work that's in press at Biological Psychiatry now, again by my postdoc, Nicole Karcher. And she looked at um, this network as well as the frontal parietal network and found that greater PQB distress scores were associated with reduced connectivity of this network, um, a similar pattern that we see in people with schizophrenia. Now I will say, the strength of this relationship is much weaker in these kids as compared to adults with schizophrenia, but it, but it is definitely there. Um, and as papers often get better in review, when we originally did the study, we focused just on several networks that we had identified ahead of time. And the reviewers said, no, 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 look at every single brain work, network because maybe it's not so specific. And that was actually quite interesting because it turned out it was the only cortical network to show this effect. None of the other ones did. And then we also, they also asked us to look at subcortical networks. And we only found one other subcortical network involving the striatum that also showed this effect. So it seemed to be relatively specific, even when looking at all these different networks. We've also looked at brain structure. Um, so there, if you look at kind of um, studies like meta-analysis studies that aggregate data across many different studies to say where are the most consistent findings of differences in brain volume amongst people with schizophrenia. And what you see, the most consistent findings in the volume or thickness of the thalamus, hippocampus, insula, 
anterior cingulate again, and the prefrontal cortex. <clears throat> so we looked at these regions in our ABCD sample um, and looked at uh, whether or not volume of these regions was associated with increased uh, psychotic-like experiences, distress scores. And what we see, down is worse. Um, so these are correlations with, associations with psychotic-like experiences. So um, down means there's a correlation between increased psychotic-like experiences and reduced volume. Um, and all of these, on first blush, showed significant associations such that you got smaller volume associated with increased psychotic-like experiences. Um, truth in advertising, these are not hugely strong relationships. We, remember, we have a lot of kids, so it's fairly easy to get significance. Um, but they were, they were associated. We then asked, well, what about specificity? What if we kind of control for whole brain volume? Is there anything that is more specifically associated with psychotic-like experiences? And interestingly, the only thing that survives when you do that is the thalamus being significant. So reduced volume of the thalamus, sort of an important relay communication region of the brain, showing reduced volume amongst individuals who have increased psychotic-like experiences. Hippocampus was close, but was not actually significant. So hopefully what I've shown you is that we do think that we can identify psychotic-like symptoms um, in children. Um, they seem to be greater in individuals who have a family history of psychosis, which is what you'd expect. They also seem to be greater in children who have early speech and motor delays, again, consistent with the kind of clinical high risk and prediction literature. They are associated with lower IQ and worse cognitive function, and particularly in cognitive functions that have been associated with schizophrenia. And they also seem to be associated with reduced brain connectivity and networks that are important for cognitive control, um, and associated with uh, re reductions in the volume of brain regions, important, I think, for cognitive function. Thalamus is, def well, thalamus is important for a lot of things, not just cognitive function. All right, so what now? Right? We have this kind of baseline data. We've shown this. What do we do with it? Um, one of the things we need to do now is really try to understand um, who are the kids who continue to have these experiences. Um, there is actually a literature out there suggesting that for many children and adolescents, psychotic-like experiences are transient and go away. Right, So we don't want to pathologize that if it's not going to be a problem. Um, so we are interested in looking at who are the kids who continue to report these experiences over multiple waves. Presumably, we would think those kids are at a higher risk. Um, we also want to look at how it interacts with substance use. And cannabis is something we're particularly interested in. Um, there's much debate in the literature about the causal role of cannabis. Um, we have some of our own work in twins suggesting what I would call a double hit hypothesis, the idea that there may be shared ge genetic predispositions to both psychosis and cannabis use but that among those folks who have psychosis, using cannabis may be more detrimental than among those who don't. So the embedded twin design in ABCD, looking at a discordant twin design is a way to try to really tease apart the causal effects. Um, we do want to try to understand which kids may be on a pathway to a, uh, progressing to more clinically diagnosable psychosis, although I will argue that kids who have persistent and distressing psychotic-like experiences that are associated with functional impairment may be very well in need of intervention themselves, even if they never progress to a more severe form of psychosis. But then we have to identify interventions, um, because if we are going to identify people at risk, it's going to behoove us to try to do something. And so hopefully what we'll be able to do is learn the lessons from the clinical high-risk work to see if we can adapt some of those things down, even for younger people earlier in the course of illness. Um, I was wondering about um, racial diversity in your coders. Mm -hmm. And so for those open-ended questions on the PQB. So we didn't actually code them, right? Um, I looked at all of them to see whether like the vast majority were or not. So, but then we decided that there was probably enough that weren't that we were just gonna, we in our own stuff, were just gonna use the kids self-report and not second guess it. But all that data is available if someone doesn't believe that and they wanna go back and say, I'm gonna, cause you're absolutely right, there could be, um, we know there are, yeah, cultural variation and neighbor, like neighborhood variations, right? In terms of what you might experience, you know, what you what what you consider to be normative or not normative. So there, it's definitely in there. 
I don't want to pretend it's not in there. We ended up thinking that it probably wasn't accounting for enough of the variance for us to kind of go back and second guess all the kids, but, but we certainly could do that. And then the second question was, are you looking at all at um, familial dysfunction, trauma scores, trauma exposure? Yes, I, well, I'm not, my postdoc Nicole is. Um, and we, um, we have trauma data, parent report trauma data, and then going forward starting at year one, we have kids self-reporting as well on life events and parents reporting. We also have familial conflict data. We have geocoding to look at neighborhood adversity. We have parent report of financial adversity. So there's a lot of measure of things that you might call ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Yeah. For which one? Well, um, we have a bunch of different measures. So we have, so ACEs is like a summary score, right? So we have um, all the trauma, potential trauma items from the PTSD scale. So that includes sexual abuse, physical abuse, um, and the host of things. We have um, multiple ways of getting at financial adversity. We have um, parent mental illness. The thing we don't have, I was just telling Terry this, we don't yet have parent incarceration. We're adding that in um, to, way, I think it's wave two, we're adding it to life events measure. We didn't have that. There's other things that the Folletti de original Folletti definition had. Am I missing something? We have that. We have, we have that. The neglect has been harder. I do not think we have a good measure of neglect. We've talked to Dylan G and Katie McLaughlin about this. We can talk about it after. It's, that is one that we have struggled a bit with, is how, because we're asking parents, and if parents say I'm neglect, you know, so it, it feels like that we may have to wait till the kids are a little bit older. And even though there's a lot of problems with the retrospective report, we were just not so convinced that we were going to get a really accurate report from the parent reporting of their own neglect of the child. Yeah, that we do have parental substance abuse, including during pregnancy. Yeah, so. Um, thank you for the beautiful talk. Tara's pointing at me to ask a follow-up question in terms of your uh, parent data. We're very interested in prenatal risk factors, and so when you're talking about the parent data, do you have data on the mother's health during pregnancy? We definitely have some data on the mother's health during pregnancy. Um, I can actually get, I can show you a copy of the form we asked. So we ask about mom's health during pregnancy. We ask about mom's and Elizabeth Sowell like any credit goes to her for really pushing some of this added stuff. Mom's use of a whole bunch of different substances, caffeine, nicotine, drugs, um, how many prenatal doctors visits. Um, so there's definitely some information there. We're actually planning on going back and asking some additional information as people have identified some gaps in what we ask parents. We also get um, prematurity, we get like, did the kids spend time in the NICU? Did the, how many, how many days were they in the NICU? Did they have a fever? There's, there's a lot of <laughs> information in there. Yeah, yeah, it would be great to have information on um, maternal exposure to infection, especially severe enough for hospitalization. That is one of the follow-up things they want to go, we didn't ask originally, but now people want us to go back and ask that, because that would be really good, yeah. Environmental toxins seems to be the next. Yeah, that we don't, well, actually, I take that back. Elizabeth, again, got to start collecting baby teeth um, so that we, now we won't have it on everybody, but we're trying to get it on as many people as possible as a way of trying to get at environmental toxins early on. We do also have the geocode data, and there's some things you can pull from public databases that get at, like, how close they are to a highway and various sorts of things. Um, but we won't have like cord blood access or something from early on. Um, but the, we're hoping that the teeth give us some early measures there. We also ask about like, did they take folate supplementation during pregnancy as well? Because the guy at Harvard, whose name I'm forgetting, told us to do that. <laughs> Hi, thank you for that fascinating lecture. I'm in genetics, so I'm going to ask about, did you find any? <laughs> we're getting that too. <laughs> uh, did you find any risk factors for you know, among your population? Yeah, so we haven't, we have genetics data, we haven't looked at it yet. Um, so it's, um, it, that was a little delayed in doing the genotyping because they wanted to do more batching of samples and so they're working on cleaning it up and that will be released so we can look at, um, you know, polygenic risk scores or other sorts of things. Um, we also haven't started to look at the heritability aspects yet, that's something we want to do because we have the twin design embedded so we can look at, um, just like heritability estimates from a behavioral genetic point, we can look at heritability from a, like SNP heritability and we'll be able to look at PRS scores, but we haven't done that yet. So would you think that the functional MRI is at a point where you could be using it to predict 
t risk for? I would not say. No, I mean, right now, from the baseline data, I, I think the self-reports are going to be much stronger. Well, I, I don't know. I take that back. I mean, that's one of our research questions um, is, you know, is there added utility to the imaging data or anything beside the kid's self-report or the parent's report that will increase our predictive utility? And frankly, we don't know yet, right? It, it may not be. Um, and so it may not, you know, it, or it may be that, you know, more subtle thing. So if you look at the risk calculators that were developed for the clinical high risk literature, they don't include neuroimaging. But I don't know to what extent that is because they tried it and it didn't improve or they just didn't have it to use it. So we want to ask that question. My gut says maybe. Um, but it's going to ha it, ha it will have to be significant enough to justify that. And I'm, that I'm not 100% convinced of. But it could be. It could be that in combination with all these other things, it really does end up being important to the prediction. So I'll stop there. I could talk about that for a while. So with your study, are you, are you also collecting data on if what the interventions the parents are doing now with the kids? If they are doing meds or counseling, therapy? And do you account for that in the data and how it? We haven't accounted for it in this data that I've shown you because younger on, there's not a lot of kids that are getting stuff. But we will have to start accounting for it because every year they come back, they start to have more intervention. Um, so we're working on ways of kind of coding that in a way that's more easily digestible. We actually we have every med that the kid is taking, and kids take meds for lots of different things like you know, asthma and so on. So we're trying to come up with sort of data reduction techniques that allow us to better account for the different effects of meds. And then we ask about like, you know, is the kid getting other kinds of treatment? Might they be getting family therapy or individual therapy? So we'll have to start to take that more into account as the kids get older. I'm sure this data, and especially if you get 10 years of it, you could go a million different ways on how to improve children's lives and families' lives. So what do you predict, what do you envision being able to do um, halfway through or at the end of this? Like, what impact? Yeah, so I'll tell you what I'm most interested in, but I, there's 138 investigators in the ABCD, so I think there's a lot of variety of things. I would really like to be able to identify consistently kids who are having somewhat, con like, maintained over time distressing psychotic-like experiences and then see if we can take some of the interventions that have been shown to be at least somewhat effective for clinical high-risk individuals and age adapt them down and see whether if we provide them early on we can reduce the functional impairment and I mean I'd be happy even with that but then icing on the cake would be to you know, um, reduce their likelihood of developing a more severe psychotic disorder or reduce the severity of what they do eventually develop. So that's re that is A number one for me. The second thing is we have another line of research on suicide risk. Um, and if we could really identify useful predictors of what kids are at most risk for suicide attempts in particular, and again, intervene. So for me, those are my two big high priorities. But there are other people who have other priorities related to substance use and other a million other things. My question is, we talked a little bit earlier about the relationship of developing psychosis with other neurodevelopmental disorders. And uh, it, maybe you could say a little bit about your inclusionary or exclusionary criteria when it came to what you included in the study. And now, what I'm particularly interested in is maybe the relationship with ADHD, early symptoms that might yeah. then lead in. So we debated this a lot, and we ended up deciding to be highly inclusive because we thought this is probably going to be one of the few studies of its kind in the US. And if we exclude lots of kids, it's going to not be very generalizable. So we had many a debate about this. And so we did exclude children who had such severe autism that they were not able to participate in any mainstream schooling. But we did include kids who have autism spectrum disorders who, who were able to do mainstream schooling. That was mostly due to this, the kind of the extensiveness in the protocol and could people participate. Um, we did exclude people who had um, like, you know, already known severe genetic disorders um, or like significant brain trauma. 
Um, but we were pretty inclusive other than that. So we didn't rule anybody out for having an other psychiatric disorder. So there are definitely plenty of kids with ADHD in the sample. Um, we actually didn't see as strong a relationship to ADHD symptoms as we did see to depression and anxiety. We did look at that. And there's a hint there, but it's not at nearly as strong as the depression and anxiety. We included at year one a short SRS to get a better sense of sort of autism spectrum symptoms so we could look at overlap. Uh, we do have measures, um, you know, of, you know, learn if they had early learning disabilities, those sorts of things. So um, the measures are definitely in there. It's not, I mean, we didn't have everybody join the study, but compared to many studies, it was actually a pretty inclusive um, inclusion criteria. And we had a lot of debates about you know, do you, are you, do you include people who some people might not want to use in their analyses? And we ended up deciding, since this was a public release data set, we shouldn't necessarily prejudge what everybody wanted to do and um, that many people would want to include such individuals. So that's why we ended up being pretty inclusive. Um, and then in terms of intellectual disability, uh, what IQ levels are you allowing into the study? Um, we are not excluding people. We don't have an IQ inclusion as long as, again, they're able to be in school and mainstream education, even if they had support services, they're able to be in. Um, and then we do the whole NIH toolbox, which in theory gives you know a measure. We, we have some additional cognitive measures, so we do the, um, the uh, what's that called, matrix, um, what am I thinking? Yeah, the, yes, that, yeah. <laughs> that one. <laughs> and like the Ravens um, audit. So we have some other more stand, like before NIH toolbox um, measures. So, so we have some good estimates of IQ. And um, what kind of luck you had scanning kids? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> so it depends on de define luck. Um, meaning that we consider a child to give us data that keeps them in the study if we get at least a good T1 from them. Okay. Um, so every, everybody pretty much has, well, not, I shouldn't say, most people have a good T1. Um, then there's varying rates of success for the rest. Um, I would say probably 80% of the kids are giving us some useful functional data, whether that be task data or resting state data. I'm trying to picture that we have this whole QC web page, and I'm trying to picture the numbers on there. Um, so, like for example, I would it was about 80% of the kids that we were able to include in that functional connectivity analysis that had data that passed QC and so on. I think it will get better as the kids get older. Um, we also, for two of the three sites, we and only because it didn't work the other, we used this new software technology that. Um, Damien Fair and Nico Dosenbach developed called FIRM, which actually monitors head motion in real time. Well, so the T1 and the T2, where possible, meaning not on the Philips, because the Philips doesn't have this yet, but the Siemens and the GE scanners, we do online motion detection and correction for the anatomy scans, and that has definitely helped. And then we do FIRM for all the functionals where they can be tracking how much motion the kids are showing and use it either to stop and interrupt and try to intervene with the kid and get them to you know, hold still, or in an optimistic scenario, if they give us X number of minutes of good data, we can stop, right? That doesn't happen very often. Um, but that has, we think, been helpful. But there are definitely some kids who still, um, you know, are just moving too much or, buy, you know, get tired of doing it. It's a long protocol, and, you know, total, it's about two hours. And that's a lot for nine and 10 year olds. And, you know, some sites split it up into two sessions. With the twin sites, it's been really hard to do that because we have twins come together, so they have to do all two hours at the same time. Um, and they are troopers, 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 but it's, it's hard at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any particular reason why you chose not to Yes, actually. So this was another big debate. So. Younger would be even better from the sense of really getting a developmental baseline before exposure to substance. But the younger you go, the longer it is before you have outcomes. So 9, 10 was sort of where we settled on, where we thought the vast majority of kids wouldn't have any exposure to substances at that point in time, other than maybe like a sip at a, a religious thing. Um, but closer to the period where they would start to use things, potentially use things, and we would have outcomes. Um, 
So it was just a very practical, like, we, you know, ideally I'd study kids in utero on, but then it would take 20 years, 30 years to get to outcomes. And so that was the, that was the compromise that we made. I'm, um, I would be interested to know with us, uh, some of the trauma data that you said you were collecting, um, the full PTSD checklist and ACEs and so forth. Um, if uh, the folks at your different sites have run into situations of like making CPS reports, yeah, and otherwise kind of you know helping to remove kids from situations that are like causing them trauma. We, well, our job, the, to be quite clear, it's never the investigator's role to remove kids. It's always the investigator's role to report to CPS if they have something, and then CPS has to take it over. So you, we don't ever want the investigators to be in the position of trying to make a decision about whether what should be happening. It's just there's a there's a conflict of interest there, right? Because you know you don't so so people do have to make reports. I should say the much bigger thing has been um, dealing with suicidal ideation in kids, um, and and this was um, I think a surprise for a lot. What honestly, it wasn't a surprise for me. But you know, a lot of sites were more substance use sites and hadn't necessarily had a lot of experience working with mental health. So we have done a lot to put procedures in place to train the RAs um, on how to uh, assess it, understand when we need to intervene, think about staged intervention, um, you know, how to provide resources to families. Um, so I, you know, like I'm the clinical backup for all of our, our, our sites people. So I get a lot of phone calls. I got one yesterday from one of the RA staff with a kid who reported, you know, a, a suicide attempt in the past two weeks. Well, it turned out it was two years ago, but nonetheless, if it's two years ago, if parents don't know, it is still our ethical obligation. So we are very clear with kids during the consent process that everything you say is confidential except if you, we have reason to believe that you are a danger to yourself or others, or you know, if you report something that you know is a you know abuse or something like that, because we want kids to trust us, but we need to be very clear that we can't maintain that trust, we can't maintain that confidentiality in all situations. So there have been a number of times when we've had to say to kids like, "We remember we told you, except, and this leads us to believe that." We're worried about your safety, and we feel like it's important for you to share this with your parents. Most of the time, at baseline, I'd say 100% at base time, at least at our site, mom and dad already knew the kid was not sharing something new. At follow up, we are starting to get more instances where the kid has not yet shared it with their parent, and so then then we work with the RAs, or I come and do it to to work with the kid to help share with their parent. Um, but I have had to make. CPS call. We call it something different in Missouri, but CPS calls in, in rare occasions. I think we're not going to get as much of that in this kind of study as you might think because parents are volunteering to come into the study. And often if families have that going on, they are not necessarily going to bring themselves into a situation where we tell them ahead of time that we're going to ask you questions about these things. So I think probably some of our refusals to participate in the study are people who may have more family trauma or abuse that they are not so, you know, interested in us finding out about. Yeah. If you have to make a CPS report, does the child stay in the study? Do you keep tracking them? Um, if the family is still willing to come in and participate, then yes. You know, um, th there have, not at our site, I have heard from, uh, you know, that there have been some kids who have been removed. Sometimes there are kids who've been removed not having to do anything with us. Like, we didn't know anything about it, but then we find out that kid is now living with grandma because there was an abuse report, and if, um, but we can't have them come in if their guardian is not part of the study. So if, if grandma has not obtained guardianship, but kid is not with mom or dad, we cannot continue to run that kid without parental permission. So it does still have to be that the guard, the person who has legal right to consent for that child, has to be be able to come in with us still. Are you collecting any symptom information that isn't self-report? We are not doing that. Well, we do case ads, but it is, um, so for, we are using the newest version of the case ads, which is a computer-assisted one. Um, so for parents, it is actually, parents do it on their own about the kid. For the kid, the version we're using was originally designed to be um, kid self-report 12 and older. Um, but since we started using it younger, they, um, Joan Kaufman, who developed it, helped us kind of do an RA-assisted one. So the RA works with the kid to do the case ads. It's kind of still self-report, though, right? Because you're not, the RA is not making a clinical judgment that they're substituting for the kid's report. They're just helping them negotiate that. Um, 
so we probably just with this many sites and this many kids, we are probably not going to be doing clinician administered interviews for the study. Um, but we do also get teacher report each year on the kid and we have parent report, but again, not clinician administered ones. The UC Davis Mind Institute was created in 1998 with the promise to find cures for neurodevelopmental disorders. Every day, our physicians and researchers come closer to fulfilling that promise. Their groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other brain disorders are helping children achieve their fullest potential. Please visit our website to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.